Hi there, and welcome to another interview. I've got the fabulous and amazing Emily Harper with me today, and I'm going to ask Emily the same question I ask absolutely everybody. Hey, Emily, why did you become carnivore? Hi, Stephen. Thank you for having me on the channel. It's uh, an honor to be here. I became carnivore because I was fed up of not being healthy and being in pain. Uh, I had had a car accident a few months earlier and had been doing well with losing weight. And then the car accident set me back. So I had gained a lot of weight. I was in a lot of pain. I was insatiable, whether it was a, a massive meal of, you know, take out junk food or a healthy home cooked meal, so to speak, or a big bowl of broccoli with salt, like nothing could satiate my hunger. And about 10 to 11 months earlier, I had come across a friend, his name's Tony. We had both done first year of some study together. We'd had a gap year, we're on second year uh, registration, and he'd lost a whole lot of weight. And uh, I commented and asked him what he was doing, and he said, oh, carnivore. And he told me about it, and he's like, you should do it. I'm like, oh, no, women need fruits and vegetables for reproductive. Like, this is this is ridiculous. Um and so fast forward to the June, June 15 of 2020, and I'm sitting there and I've had breakfast and snacks already. And I'm just like, this is, this is stupid. My, my life right now with food and health and memory and everything is just stupid. And so I messaged him and said, tell me about this carnivore. And then I jumped on YouTube and I Googled um, negative consequences of carnivore, dangers of carnivore, etc. while I'm waiting for him to reply. And I came across these videos from Dr. Ken Berry, Callie Hogan, Steak and Butter Girl. They were the three that kept coming up. And but then there were also videos from random people who I who I don't I don't follow anymore. They're not in the carnivore world. And they're talking about like getting the runs and the aches and pains and everything. And I'm, I'm listening to their content and their time frame, And I'm like, my sister's done keto. And I'm like, this is keto flu. How is this a negative? And then I'm like, well, I have Crohn's disease and I'm very used to the runs in the bathroom. Like if this is going to correct the Crohn's disease to get through, you know, even if it was three months of transition with the runs, I'm like, big deal. And so at about 11.30 a.m. on June 15, 2020, I, for the first time, just switched cold turkey to carnivore. And that's where my journey started. Um, but to, to backtrack a little bit, in sort of elementary, primary school age, so up to about sixth grade, I was super active, played basketball. I um, joined, I then transitioned to high school, so seventh grade, um, and stopped playing basketball. I went to a different school than my team. And so it just kind of transitions changed things. Uh, I was also bullied a lot. And so I began comfort eating. And so comfort eating or even the same amount of calories and no exercise or little to none and also transitioning into puberty. And I started to put on some weight. And, you know, I got the comments from family like, lick of the lips, straight to the hips, you'll gain an extra donut, you'll be the size of a house. And none of that really had any um, context for me at that age. But then I changed high schools in ninth grade. And that's when I first was introduced to dieting. Um, my mom, with all of her good intentions and absolutely correctly, was trying to help me to maintain a healthy life. But some of the things we did were weight loss bars, like the diet bars, diet smoothies. So I'd have like one for lunch and breakfast and then, you know, a regular dinner. But they're they're filled with so much junk and I was having kind of digestive issues that were sort of present and not present. I stopped tolerating tomato-based sauces, um, you know, uh, pizza to a degree sir, and things. And it was suspected that I had an issue with um, with fructose or fructans, but it didn't come up on any testing. And then um, I sort of started sneaking stuff back in as time went on and I gained a lot of weight. I left school in year 10 and started a career as a chef, which I didn't follow through with. 
So what ended up transpiring was my eating was astronomical. Um, I could get, you know, the the Cadbury chocolate bars, which are, you know, pretty much this big. And I could eat that for breakfast in five minutes and have six or seven of them in a day, as well as a couple of McDonald's meals, which included the drink and the soft serve, you know, usually a McFlurry or a Sunday with with the extra toppings. And um, it's somewhat proud and somewhat embarrassing the amount of food that I could consume and not just, you know, vomit it back up. Um, was it emotional eating? Absolutely. Was it food addiction? I have no doubt. And I know it was food addiction because of how I uh, interact with food today and the thought processes and how aware I've become with that. Um, at some point during all of this, I did see a dietitian. Uh, she diagnosed me with, um, she said there is a scale of anorexia, so from normal to anorexia. And she diagnosed me with the stage before anorexia, even though I was overweight because of how I interacted with food. Um, I was also diagnosed as a food addict at some point throughout their um, type 2 diabetes. Uh, my dad's dad had that. He didn't manage it, died from it in his 50s. My dad now has it. Several times I thought I have had it, but I've being diagnosed as not having it and I wonder if I would have been considered pre-diabetic but we're talking you know testing um 10 to 15 years ago so with some of these regular everyday doctors they may not have the insight and skill to have looked at different tests to confirm um pre-diabetes I know that Laura Spath had that experience so Fast forward to, um, well, to fill in a slight gap there, I have tried many diets. I've tried Weight Watchers several times. I've done smoothies. I've tried starvation. I have tried to make myself throw up. I could never do it. Um, I have tried laxatives. I've tried body trim, which body trim was actually the most effective. It's uh, heavily protein-based. Um with a cycle day of, you know, it was supposed to be eat one meal of whatever you want, but I made it the whole day. Then the next day you would do protein only. And then the other five days you would do protein with with low carb, but it was 100 grams of protein at three meals and, and 50 grams of protein at um, three snacks throughout the day. And that was that was the best. I'd done really well with that. But it wasn't uh, sustainable. It's what I know now. It certainly doesn't give you the full nutrients of what you need. It doesn't keep you satiated um, like carnivore does, eating high fat and eating to satiety. Um, so I have tried a number of different things, and it's it's been a very unpleasant journey. I did try a tablet at one point for weight loss, which my friend had very successfully used. Um, but it quickened my heart rate and landed me in the emergency room. And so I immediately stopped that about two days later. But again, her journey has been to use all these quick solutions, lose, I'm talking close to a hundred pounds. And then, you know, within a few months, put that on plus more and it, reflecting back on this over the last week, that's not the kind of lifestyle that I want to live. I want to do something about my weight and my health and have it stick. Uh, so fast forward through to June 2020 when I start carnivore and I decided every 30 days I was going to have a blue moon day where I could have some things that weren't carnivore. Um, so I had my friend's 30th and I did that and that went well. I did another 30 days and then I had a couple of things. I did another 30 days so I got to day 90 and uh, I think I got like a chocolate bar, some chocolate truffles. And then for dinner, I had, you know, mod pizza. And then I got ice cream afterwards. And that combination of pizza and ice cream is not wise. Uh, and so then I went off the rails for a while. Um, and so 20 in 2020 into uh, 2021, that was where I was doing the kind of carnivore where it's carnivore but then you add in ice cream 
or a Starbucks drink or this carb or that carb. It was the processed foods. It wasn't like I was eating fruits and vegetables, although I would at times have them. That's the really dangerous, you know, carnivore way of eating. It would be better had I just been eating like whole foods, like fruits and vegetables, um, but doing those processed sugars and, you know, um, high fat, moderate protein carnivore, it's not wise to combine them. And I moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma during this time. And, and that transition was um, challenging. The living environment was challenging to maintain carnivore. And I, I did my best, but I added in a whole lot of stuff. And then um, some life events happened. And those life events uh, caused severe clinical depression, like off the charts, um, severe clinical anxiety that wasn't quite off the charts, but it was at the very top. And I got diagnosed with those by a doctor in September of 2021. Uh, what I didn't get diagnosed with was suicidal ideation. So I, the reason that didn't occur is I didn't mention it. Because if I had mentioned it, I would have got admitted and forced onto drugs and I cannot take mental health drugs. They would have probably put me in ICU. Um, I, I don't I don't know what would have happened after that, but they are bad news for me. I cannot take any of them. That is um, has been agreed upon by myself, my doctor, uh, a doctor, a physician, a specialist, and my mom, who is a um, highly qualified nurse uh, in Australian nursing standards. Um, so I didn't mention that to anyone. Um, fast forward to just before Thanksgiving of 2021, and I kept trying to go carnivore and stay carnivore, but I was really struggling. I started a YouTube channel to try and help myself be accountable for that. And I was listening to Kelly Hogan and she was interviewing Dr. Georgia Ede. It was the first time I've heard of her. And she said, sugar causes depression and anxiety. Sugar is also carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are fruits and vegetables. And she said, for some people, that could be a piece of lettuce. It doesn't have to be a donut. Uh, I'm pr probably using some different examples there than what she did, but that's that's what she was saying. And I felt in that moment that God said to me, Emily, you can't take mental health drugs. If you're going to go to counseling and you're going to deal with this stuff and address these issues, your medication, so to speak, is going to be to cut out any and all forms of sugar, like stevia, whole foods, processed anything. Um, and so I did that the second day after Thanksgiving. Uh, it took me a while to you know, get fully on the bandwagon. Uh, I think I joined Steak and Butter Gang in February and I had a few ups and downs. And then in May or June, it might have been June 1st, I found I needed a bit more um, of a smaller community to be a bit more focused to get me going. And so I switched over and I joined Kelly Hogan's coaching. Um, and that was what I needed in that moment. So I was with Kelly from June of 2022 until maybe April of 2023. I needed to take a break financially. And I went from June 1 of 2023, no, 2022, sorry, until the middle to late uh, January of 2023. So I went seven and a half months clean carnivore. Three months of that was without tea, without dairy. And it was fantastic. I did really well. I had a few wobbly moments between January and maybe March and then did really good April, May into June, occasionally having a, a red wine or a Bailey's, but very, very rare. Um, and then I, uh, so during 2023, I was dating someone and I broke up with him the middle of June and it was quite a messy, painful breakup. I'd also never been through one before. So it was a whole new experience for me. And I emotionally ate and trashed my health until the end of December, so of last year. 
And I was still trying to do carnivore, but I mean, I'm talking about eating one to two pints of ice cream in a sitting several days a week, you know, several pizzas, um, fries, like it was usually always processed foods, usually always carbs. I would go through the Starbucks on the way to work and then go through the other one at the other end close to work. And, you know, some days I would have seven cake pops, you know, and a chocolate croissant and a frappe. Like it was excessive. Um, So all of those unhealthy habits from my teenage years and 20s had followed me through. And then as it got towards Thanksgiving, I put on so much weight, none of my clothes were fitting. And I knew I'm like, I I know how depressed and anxious I am right now. I, I need to change this. But every time I tried, I just, I don't know, it it just wouldn't, wouldn't work. And I, I couldn't get it to stick. And so fast forward to the end of, end of November, early December. And I thought, I feel so sick. I had been sick several times from the toddler that I nanny and I I wouldn't normally get that. And um, I knew, I knew I needed to do something different. And a couple of weeks before Christmas, I'm like, I'm done. My immune system's trashed. I'm so done with being sick. I'm so done with not wanting to leave the house because I'm, I'm so overweight and so inflamed and none of my clothes fit. And um, I had one pair of jeans like one one pair of jeans and maybe three tops and maybe one or two sweaters. Like none of it was what I wanted to wear to church or anything. It was just I could wear it to work. So like I really didn't want to leave the house. And I knew I'm like, I, I don't want to go through transition and the hard part of this over Christmas and New Year's. New Year's Eve is my birthday. And so I, I just didn't want to I, – I didn't have capacity. My head was not in a good place. And I decided I'm like, I'm going to eat carnivore as best I can. And if when I'm out with friends at at events, Christmas, my birthday, if I eat stuff that isn't carnivore, so be it. And I didn't use that time to be like, well, I'm going to be carnivore on the 1st of January, so I'm going to eat this and eat that. And I'm going to, let's go to this place so I can have it before I start carnivore again. I was like, no. And so by the time we got to December 29, I was at the, I can't wait for January 1. I'm so ready. I'm so done. Um. New Year's Eve comes around, it's my birthday, I'm driving in the car and I feel this on sort of my upper waist on one side, I feel this kind of pain and itchiness and it was sort of subconscious and then as I sort of tried to the itch a little bit or whatever, I was like, oh no, I know this, I know what this is. I get home at, uh, might have even been three in the morning, we were in Sacramento, I live in Northern California and Sure enough, I have a look in the mirror and I have shingles. And I'm like, okay, well, I can't fully remember what causes shingles, but I looked it up and it's stress and a compromised immune system or lowered immune system. And that makes sense. In the last 10 years, this is the fourth time I've had shingles and I knew my immune system was compromised. I had the fourth or fifth cold in the space of three months from this toddler and so January 1, I went back to carnivore and I have not looked back and my mentality is completely different. Depression and anxiety is gone. Scalp psoriasis is gone. Um, I mean, so, so so much of an improvement in such a short period of time. It's been fantastic. Brilliant, Emily. Thank you for sharing that. And obviously some really tough things to talk about. Yeah. Um it's good that you mentioned that you went from a bigger group, the Steak and Butter Gang, which is great for many people. I mean, I, I, I had a lovely couple of years there as a, as yeah. a coach, and then going to that smaller group with Kelly, which is which is what some people sometimes need that slightly more sort of personal attention. I'm glad that worked for you. Um, I just want to quickly ask you because I, you know before we started, I said there's always things I I like to pick up on. You mm-hmm. had that car accident, did any? Before that, did you have any of your conditions? You know, you said you've had shingles yeah. four times. Did you have things before the car accident? Oh, absolutely. So the shingles actually started, now Now I know what causes shingles as well. It actually started as a side effect of the medication I was on for Crohn's. Uh, I was diagnosed with that uh, early 2012 after being told in late 2011, you definitely don't have Crohn's. Um Crohn's is difficult to diagnose, so the doctor shouldn't have said that. Um, 
but that's fine. Yeah, I had uh, I was diagnosed with IBS, so a few of the the FODMAPs, so issues with fructans, issues with galacto oligosaccharides, issues with polyols, so the sugar alcohols um, such as sorbitol, isomalt, inositol, anything that ends with ol, as well as isomalt. Um, so anything that's sugar free will have a sugar alcohol in it, as well as things like watermelon, mushrooms, blackberries. I have like this part of the tip of my finger, my nail size worth of watermelon. And within five minutes, I'm in the bathroom with IBS symptoms. Um, and it's it's awful. It's quite instant. Um, so watermelon is very much out for me. Um, psoriasis, um, temporomandibular joint issues, which is my jaw locking up sometimes. I clench my jaw a lot. Um, that has dramatically settled down since re-going carnivore. Um, I have some things written down here. Uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, that was one that I was diagnosed with. I was on uh, 40 milligrams of pantoprazole. I managed to very painfully wean myself off of that, and I do occasionally get um, some reflux or heartburn and I think it's um, dairy or tea, definitely hot sauce, and occasionally too many electrolytes. But sometimes I don't get it and sometimes I do. So, you know, it's sort of a little bit of a game there. Um, yeah, I will say as well, I didn't mention this before, but with the depression anxiety, I mentioned suicidal ideation. So the carnivore dealt with the depression and anxiety and then one day I was in church and the speaker was speaking and they prayed for people with suicidal thoughts. And in that moment, that left. So I really felt like God led me to address what I could address. And then he's like, and you've been faithful and here is the bit I'm going to do for you in the moment. Um, so I don't deal with that anymore, but I don't put that down to carnivore. Uh, I just wanted to be really clear. I'm not dealing with that. Um I've had some really weird things that have occurred. I I don't know if the, I don't say they're related to the car accident, um, but I don't really know when they occurred. So I've had pain in my fingerprints. That's like I'm being pricked with needles. Since going carnivore, that's gone. Um, if I would lay in bed on my phone, so like my phone sort of being held up here, I would get numb hands. That's gone on carnivore. Uh, recently, I had to do a glucose tolerance test and I needed to eat some unprocessed carbs for a couple of days before that. And I got the numbness back in my hands again. So that was just less than 48 hours of eating carbs and that numbness came back. Um, I also get uh, random pain in this knuckle on my hands. And so I would be driving and just resting my hands on the steering wheel would, um, it was very painful. It was like I was, I had a nail that you'd bang into a wall and pressing my my knuckle into that. Um, that's gone. Uh, daily nausea as well. I don't really know what was causing daily nausea, but I would have to take anti-nausea medication some days to be able to sleep. Um, and that's gone. Uh, dry skin, my skin is great. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, hormones seem to be settling down. I don't really know what the deal was with those. I just knew that they were not good um, and they're settling down. Sleep is also great um, and also really annoying. Just in the last week to 10 days, uh, I usually get up at six. My alarm goes off at six. I think it's ungodly to get up beforehand. Um, and I have been waking up just after five, if not just before, and I can't get back to sleep. So I'm getting up and I'm going walking, just get up, get dressed, get out the door and go for a walk before work. And so some days I've walked for half an hour, but now I'm getting up before six. Some days I'm work walking for an hour to an hour and a half. Fabulous. And I don't think there's anything yeah. wrong with that. If you wake up and you feel refreshed, yeah. get out there, get that morning sunlight. Uh, I just yeah. want to add in. I don't know if you okay. know this. I mean, many years I've been a phlebotomist and the glucose tolerance test is an awful test. It doesn't do anything yes. because you shouldn't be able to to uh, 
to tolerate 75 grams of carbohydrates in a drink. That, that's not a good thing. That You don't get that no. level of sugar in nature. So uh, I, I, understand, I understand why you've biohacked it, um, but it is an awful test. One of the things... I think you, you amazingly covered everything there. I know you had to go mm -hmm. to your notes, but one of the things you put in the uh, email to me is you wanted to discuss iron in blood work. I thought the glucose yes. tolerance test is something because I deal with the blood work. Um, mm -hmm. Why did you want to talk about iron in blood work? Look, iron has been a really interesting journey for me. I, When I first got my periods, they would be super, super heavy um, and have all the way through. And like... Any other kid who has heavy periods, you go to the doctor, they suggest the pill, you go on the pill, and that, you know, um, lessens the amount that that is dumped out of your body. Um, and so that's what I did. I When I went on that, though, my iron was quite low. Uh, so my iron stores, not the iron that is uh, balanced through food. And so I would need iron in infusions and I had two or three of those throughout the years I think um, one of the more recent ones I was uh, early 20s and then I found it very convenient that when I would go on holidays to skip a cycle um, so skip those those sugar pills and just go straight back in to the regular pills and then I found it was really nice to skip every other cycle it was also cheaper because you know less purchasing of products and then I found it really nice to just not have a cycle. So for a year, somewhere between a year or two, I know it was less than two years, I did not allow myself to have a cycle. It was wonderful. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was kind of unintentional at the beginning. And then just I was like, oh, well, this is really nice. Um, and then my iron stores were astronomically high. So I got tested for hemochromatosis surprisingly one of my friends has it so she was talking to me all about it um and then they did the test and i didn't have both markers so i didn't have hemochromatosis and the solution was go give blood because that will lower your iron stores um well the problem was because i had crohn's disease and because i was on infliximab which is an immunosuppressant um people on this side of the globe would probably call it humira um i couldn't give blood and so it was like well what do i do and that was i can't remember what the solution was um but nothing ended up happening and i just lived with this high iron uh, so since I've been in the US continuously, which has been since August 2019, I have not had blood tests until February. And then I had them actually a month apart, the 2nd and the 28th of February. And my iron stores then, oh, I didn't, I didn't write it down, but it's within range. It's per, I think it's 140 and the max end is apparently 150. Um, and that has never, ever, ever been the case for me. I've either been low needing an infusion or I've been really high and people concerned about hemochromatosis. Okay. And is your cycle back? Is that something that's happened? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I actually ended up going off um, the pill um, because I was only taking it for regulation and i was like i don't like i feel like this is causing way too much damage for my body this would have been back in maybe even 2012 it was quite early on i did try getting an implant on at one point um but that didn't work for me they took it out about three to four weeks later and so then i'm like well i just won't use anything i just i will I, will, I don't want to use anything that's going to mess with my cycle anymore. At some point, I'm going to want kids and I just don't want to cause any damage to my body and have anything in it that doesn't need to be in there. Um, and it took about three to four years for not only my cycle to get back to something regular, but also for um, like pain to settle down and, and things like that. Um, and there's a whole lot more that could be said for that that's completely unrelated to carnivore so i won't go into that but um i saw a lot of improvement in my monthly cycle on carnivore i've seen that double so i've, I've seen double the improvement on carnivore um 
you don't need the pill to regulate your cycle or to to minimize the amount of blood loss. So, yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. That's very personal, but it's it's good to know yes. because people will ask that question. Um, they will. Just a, a real brief um, interlude, just to talk about the weight. Um, mm -hmm. Can you remember what the heaviest you ever got to and what is the lightest you, you became? Yes. The heaviest I got to was 94 kilos, which is 200 and something pounds, two, 202 or 212, I think it is, somewhere around that. Um, the lightest I have gotten to, I think, has been 65 kilos. I don't know what that was in or is in pounds, but... I was not eating sugar of any kind other than uh, fruits and vegetables, um, minimal meat. Um, I really couldn't eat a lot. So sometimes my dinner was a zucchini sliced into rounds with some goat's cheese and a bit of tomato paste. And then I was going working out at boot camp style um, routines for at least an hour, five to six times a week, as well as walking. I was definitely in starvation mode. I was exhausted all the time. Like it, it was, it was not a good way to lose weight. And that would have been um, August of 2015. I would have been at my lightest. Um, I was almost into. I was. I was. I was in just in a size 10 Australian in um, uh, like a cocktail dress fitting size of clothing. Um, I haven't yet got back to that. I was close last year before I went off the rails. I was uh, maybe, no, I was, pr I was pretty close to that. I was only one or two kilos away from that. Right. Okay. And the, what is your ideal body weight then? Is, is it that what you want to get to? No, I think my ideal body weight would be um, 55 kilos. Sorry to all the Americans. I don't know what that is in pounds. Um, but 55 kilos, it would be a size 6 to 8 Australian. So maybe like a size 8 American clothing size. But again, I don't know if on carnivore I'll get to that weight because if I've got a whole lot of muscle, it weighs more than fat. So I could get to that physique but my weight could still be 60 to 65 quite easily. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Yeah. yeah. About 120 pounds, by the way. You just multiply kilogram okay. by 2.2, just so you know. Thank you. Right. That is not my strong point. <laughs> now then, look at this. Uh, you've got this history of, of not being particularly healthy, but you've got your health back. And um, you are now what's known as a living, or will be, hopefully, a living kidney donor. So I'd love to yeah. tell me a little bit about that, please. Yeah, that that is why I needed to do that glucose test. And, and I suggested to them a CGM and they said, look, this is how we need to do it. And so I contacted Kelly and I'm like, Kelly, what do I do? Um, and she's like, because I know she has all the connections with all the doctors and she's like, do this. But there were a few other tests I had to do. So she suggested 24 hours. I increased it to just over 48 hours transitioned in very slowly and then did two days of of some low-key carbs with my meals. Um, so I have a friend who is already a kidney recipient. It's been about 10 years and as what can often happen, her kidney is failing. She's back on dialysis. She's back on um, the NDK registry um, and needs a kidney. And when she was in ICU and she was finding all of this out, I messaged her and said, uh, I'd like to offer you a kidney if you need it. So there are a couple of relatives in her life that are also getting tested. Um, I'm the only friend who's getting tested. Uh, I have been progressed to the next stage, which is where I'll go into um, the hospital for a day and they'll do a barrage of tests over that day. I still haven't found out if I can donate directly to her or not. They haven't done that test yet. Um, but I am waiting to hear back from them as to whether or not, uh, uh, sorry, as to when that day is of testing. Fortunately, that one doesn't require me to change my eating in any way. Um, but I know, like, I'm still considered overweight. They will say to me, we want you to lose some weight. I'll be like, fine, I'm already doing that. By the time I get there, I will have already lost more weight. Um, but I think it's super valuable if you're going to donate a kidney to be in good health. And I think carnivore is the best way to do that. 
didn't know any of the medical stuff behind that, but through Dr. Berry, I found Dr. Jason Fung, I think it is, who is a quite a prominent nephrologist from Canada. And he is an advocate for this way of eating, for reversing um, uh, kidney disease, I believe it is. So that's encouraging. Yeah, absolutely. And I can't wait to get the results of those tests because so many people mm -hmm. think carnivore is bad for your kidneys. And absolutely, it's not. The protein is protective for your kidneys. And all the science says that. And all the real life stories say that. So it'd be interesting to, to see... Um, how that goes now that brings me on to another subject mm -hmm. which uh, we've spoken about uh, off air which is friends and family because you there you are you've been brilliant helping you i mean you couldn't be more brilliant donating a kidney to help a friend but mm. you have had unhelpful things also said uh, to you by friends and family and i just wanted you to expand on that as well because it can be particularly unhelpful if you haven't got friends and family on board when you're eating this way yeah, I've been super fortunate that a lot of my in-person friends, you know, I've come from Australia and now live in, in Northern America, so it's it, it's interesting. But I've been very fortunate to have a lot of in-person friends who maybe they think that my way of eating is crazy, but they've been incredibly supportive. They've never said anything discouraging. They've considered me in finding a place to eat or what they would, they're like, I'll bring a side if I've invited them over for dinner, you know, things like that. And that has been amazing. My ex was super supportive as well, which was um, where food was concerned was really helpful. But I have some really close um, people in my life who I look up to, who have been very loving and supportive. They're, they're people that are in person. And I was at a gathering with them. And the topic came up again around food and carnivore and things like that. And and this person said to me, you know, I, I need you to hear I'm really concerned for you. I'm really concerned for your cholesterol. And, you know, he mentioned a few other different things. And I said, well, look, this is what I know. And I pulled out some photos of Kelly Hogan. She's been doing it for, you know, what, 15, 18 years or, or more. And he's like, yeah, no, I don't, I don't believe it. This is probably doctored like this, this can't be accurate and whatever. And then there was somebody else there. And, and both of these people are, you know, old enough to be my parents, if not a little bit older. And this person said when he had walked away, like, you, you really need to listen to what he says. You know, he loves you. He's an elder. It's worth respecting him. You know, you really need to take on board, you know, what he has said. And my response to that was something like, yeah, I will, but at the same time, I need to do what works for my health. And I, I just remember feeling really diminished and upset in that moment. That would have been in, in September, late September, early October of last year. Uh, no, actually, I'm sorry. It would have been... Um, just before the end of May, so maybe around May 20 of last year. And then um, the middle of June, I went off the rails and I remember sitting on the couch feeling so sick. Like I was taking Tylenol and anti-nausea medication, preempting the food I was going to eat so I could eat it and minimize the severity of the impact and how sick and uncomfortable I would feel. And I remember hearing those words in my head, uh, you know, of different people going, this is bad for your cholesterol. This is really going to harm your health. And and just being discouraged by them to continue, surely vegetables are okay. And and my my response now, especially now I can think more clearly, is say that to someone with a peanut allergy. Tell them peanuts are okay. Say that to an alcoholic because he was actually an alcoholic. He, he doesn't touch alcohol at all anymore. And here he is trying to force me to eat something that would send me off the rails. And I've got the evidence of the six and a half months of last year to show it sends me off the rails. I'm like an alcoholic is with alcohol. That's what I'm like with food that has any degree of sugar in it. Um, I struggle to to balance dairy and to moderate dairy. So um, he was really pushing me to get blood work done. I, I Financially, I couldn't afford it. I've been able to get private health insurance this year as well as all the kidney testing. So I've had a whole lot of blood tests done. My A1C is five. 
my triglycerides at the beginning and then the end of the month were 129 and then 94. My HDL was 35, then 50, and my LDL was 125, then 113. So I knew that my numbers were okay, but I didn't have any evidence of it, and now I do, which is kind of nice to have to be able to go, look, I don't know how to explain it, but I know this is fine to eat this way. Oh, and now also I have the blood tests here. Have a look. Yeah. And it's a big, it's a big yeah. deal because the whole cholesterol hypothesis, which hasn't been proved, and it was it was originally postulated in the 19th century, in the, actually 1900, that's when it was first postulated. A, a mm -hmm. Russian researcher thought that maybe cholesterol was a problem, couldn't prove it. Um, and that was only because they did an autopsy on somebody and um, or a few people and they found fatty deposits after a heart attack. Uh, now we know the analogy that most people use is that's like blaming a firefighter for a fire. Uh, cholesterol was there to repair. And we, we know all this and it's never been proven. There's no causal link that's ever been proven in any study. And it's it, it's more and more when you look at the, you know, the facts and the figures that People with um, higher cholesterol, well, they these are these are the facts. They live longer. Mm -hmm. They have less yep. uh, mortality. And and um, I just want to show you my book, by the way, the guide to blood okay. tests, because this comes up all the time. Okay. So I've done a whole thing. I mean, I've been fifteen years as a phlebotomist giving private blood tests, and it's all in the context of low carb, ketogenic, and carnivore. But these very things, and it's all referenced. It's all true stories. And uh, yeah, right. So, so, um, anyway. Anyway, um, it's not. I'm not here to plug my book, but um, <laughs> people in this situation, you, there is information out there. I mean, that's got full of it's there full is. of references. Uh, Dr. Kevin Stock, his website has the best pages I've ever seen about the LDL cholesterol myth. Uh, more references than I've ever seen anywhere. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. So there's there is loads of things. Uh, your friend there was. Mm -hmm. Coming from the right place, but completely yes. uninformed and absolutely, mm -hmm. uh, you know, brainwashed because cholesterol, high cholesterol is, is not an issue. It's just not an Agreed. issue. Agreed. Right. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, but it, but these people, they don't realize that they're having this impact and they are well-meaning. It's coming from the place of love. And that's, that's what's yes. difficult, I think. Um, and I'm just, I'm talking to you, but I'm also for the people watching who might be in this situation. Do remember that they are not being malicious. They are misinformed. Correct. And also yes. they have the whole powerful media behind them and the whole big, powerful pharmaceutical advertising behind them. So it's difficult, but you just got to be the example. Exactly what yes. you said. But look yeah. at me. Yeah, it doesn't do me any good. Even if all that is true, which isn't, but even if it is, uh, it doesn't work for me. The peanut analogy exactly. is brilliant. The alcohol thing is a brilliant thing to say. Just say those things, um, possibly a bit close to home to an alcoholic to say about the alcohol, but yes. <laughs> the, pe the peanut thing would definitely work. Um, yeah. I, I think it's uh, been a brilliant conversation, actually, and I, I'm so impressed with what you uh, wanted to talk about. But one thing, as I am also an advanced personal trainer, that really got my interest, and I want to sort of finish with this. Is is you asked? Could we just could we discuss the difference between movement and exercise? So I'd, I'd love to have a yes. little look at that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A lot of people hear exercise, and what they think of is Michael Phelps in the pool, a Safa Powell on the track, you know, Kathy Freeman on the track. You know, they they think about. I got to get out and I've got to run like a lion's chasing me for 16 hours a day. And, you know, especially if you get somebody that's morbidly obese, they're really unhealthy. They go into the doctor. The doctor says, exercise. That's what comes to their mind. The problem with exercise, even if you're not trying to beat Kathy Freeman on a track or Michael Phelps in the pool, is if you get on a treadmill and run for a bit or you're like doing something that's really getting your heart rate going or your your body is subconsciously thinking a lion or an axe murderer is chasing you, your cortisol is going super high. Your cortisol is going to prevent you from losing weight or even cause you to put on weight, which if you're exercising, you're usually doing because you want to lose weight. Many, many, many people, that's the situation. So you don't want to raise your cortisol. You also want exercise to be sustainable 
and you want to enjoy doing it. Um, and you want to be able to do it when you have the time because in reality, our daily lives these days are quite packed full of, of everything and there's not really any time. So I decided to get out and walk. Um, I also personally, I don't like traditional exercise. I like the cartwheels. I like dancing. I like kayaking. I like rollerblading. But if you've got me in a gym running on a treadmill or using the stair climber or something, I couldn't roll my eyes anymore, obviously. It's just, I also want to be outside, not in winter, in summer. Put me in 114 degrees with dry humidity and I'm the one walking at 1 p.m. for two hours. So that that's how I approach things. Um, so my my advice to people, my coaching clients who I coach, myself, friends, family, anyone watching this is if you, especially if you have high cortisol, you're highly stressed or you're trying to lose weight, if you're going to want to add in exercise, call it body movement and just move your body. So go for a walk, do a leisurely stroll. You don't have to walk like a lion's chasing you or try and beat your fastest pace time. Just get the movement in, just get the steps in. It could be instead of like getting all of the things from the kitchen in your bedroom and laying on the couch for six hours watching Netflix, still do that six hours, but you get your one drink that's one standard cup. You finish that, you get up and you get another one, you sit back down and then you get up and then you go to the bathroom and then you get up and then you go get your lip balm from your bedroom and then you get up and walk across the room and get your phone on charge instead of on the stand next to you. So every now and again, you're doing this little bit of movement. Um, it could be that random cartwheel. If it's one, it's one. It's still one is better than none. Um you know, go swimming, but don't try and beat Michael Phelps. Just go for a leisurely swim, even if it's laps. Like, don't stress up your your cortisol. Um, keep it keep it low, and it, it works. You know, I I don't fully understand it. I don't have all the the scientific, you know, or, or the the numbers or letters beside my name or the degrees or anything. I just know that it does work, and I hear enough people talk about it in the carnival community to know that. I seem to be on to something. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have got an honours degree in health sciences <laughs> and I'm an advanced personal trainer. I've trained people for the Olympics. But it comes down to exactly what you just said because people say, well, you've got all those qualifications, you know all the science. When's the best time to work out? And I just say, when you can do it. Yeah. Because if your life does not fit with a six o'clock trip to the gym, you're not going to stick to it anyway, even if I say right. the best time is six o'clock. So that's the first thing. If people are watching this, and hopefully they are in droves, um, you know, that is such good advice to, to enjoy it. Pick something you enjoy. And also yeah. what you said is, is very similar to what I say. If someone's starting out and they're, that you know, they've got a lot of weight to lose, uh, you know, body fat, and that they think they've got to do insane amount of cardio, I say, look, if getting out of the chair is difficult for you, that is actually an intense exercise for you and at this point. So get mm -hmm. out of the chair more. Do that. Simple. As long as yeah. it's safe, um, that you can do that. And then do just do that more. Start with that. And just take every day as it comes. Just try to do better than you did the day before. And yes. that's all you need to do. Yes, I can do exercise programs like you just said. You can do you can pound it out at the gym. I mean the treadmill in the gym is about the least exciting thing for most people. <laughs> now yeah. I will always get messages when we say that. If it works for you, you're watching I love the treadmill. It. I I, yeah. I look out the window, great, you know? Great. That's the whole point. If it works for you, that's great because um some people say to me the treadmill's good, the monotony is actually mm -hmm. good because I can download, I can listen to a podcast and not yes. think about what I'm doing. Fine, that works for you. That's great. But it would be better to be doing something outdoors if you can. It would yes. be better to be, you know, for, for your optimal health to try and do something that involves sort of sunlight. and, and can more one more sunlight. thing back in there? Yeah, of course you can. Please do. Um, I didn't start my carnivore journey exercising. Or, or restart it this year exercising. 
I spent about two hours a day soaking in a bath bomb. I went to work, I got home, I ate, I laid in the bath, and then I went to bed and I repeated. And I that was the most expensive month or two <laughs> that I have had. That that was an expensive number of bath bombs. Um, but one day I was getting ready for work and I was like, I want to go for a walk. It it was, I mean, 34 degrees Fahrenheit. It it was cold. But I donned my jacket and I stuffed my hands in my pocket and I put on a podcast and I went outside and I had my hood on and I went for that walk and I did that three days in a row. And then I realized I was looking forward to that walk. At some point in your carnival journey, your body will heal enough that it goes, get me moving. So don't, I would say, don't try and force it. If you want to do it, go and do it. At some point, your body is going to tell you, let's go do this. Yeah, the spontaneous desire to move mm -hmm. is is very evident. Uh, I mean, I've been coaching for five years in carnival, fifteen years as a as a coach in general, um, and that spontaneous wanting to exercise, I only really saw once I started doing carnival coaching five years ago. Yeah, it just happens. There's, there, there's no need yeah it's just great yeah. so emily thank you for that uh all your links will be in the description you don't have to spill mm -hmm. them all out but of course thank if you. you could email the the links you want me to put in this yeah. description i will do that for you uh it's been an absolute pleasure thank you you too this has been a real honor